Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Now, if you recall, last Sunday I spoke on the subject, Where's the Beef? That was tape number 127. I'm speaking today on the subject, Where's the Salt? This will be tape number 128. I'd like to hear from you. I want you to pray for me. My mail has been off considerably. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. I have received a few birthday cards from some here in the church and a few on the outside. I appreciate them. Preacher will be having a birthday tomorrow if the Lord spares his life. I was born out here in Madison County in a community called the Bullock's Mill Community in those days on the old Jack Landers farm. That's just off of the highway that leads from Danielsville toward Comer or even Cobbett. Born out in the country. That's been uh, uh, some time ago. That's been two score, two decades, two years, 12 months, and 53, 52 weeks and 365 days ago, we'll be on tomorrow. And so I, that was when I was born the first time. I was born the second time in the city of Greenville, South Carolina, in the year 1940, on October the 24th. I'm glad I was born that second time. If I hadn't been born the second time, I'd been better off I'd never been born the first time. Jesus said about Judas Iscariot, it had been better if that man had never been born. Now, if you die and go to hell, you'd have been better off if you'd have never been born in this world. Now, you need to realize that. So, we covet your prayers. I want you to write to me. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune in each day at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday, you can get the daily broadcast. We'd like for you to do so. Now I hope you have that Bible open, that Matthew chapter 5, we speak it on the subject, where's the salt? Now you find the place in Matthew chapter 5. While you're turning there, I'm reminded of one cold winter snowy day. The preacher went to the church, there's nobody there. Then shortly thereafter, there came in one old farmer. He came in, he sat down near the front, and so the preacher and the old farmer were the only two there. And the preacher got up and read his text, prayed and preached a sermon and preached like the house is on fire, like he had a church full of people, just one man sitting there. Then he went back to the door to shake hands with the fellows who went out and the fellow looked kind of puzzled and the preacher said, well, now, brother, I'm glad you're here today. I know you're a farmer and I know you have cattle. And if you took a sack of salt out to the pasture to feed your cattle some salt, and only one came up, one came up, one little calf came up, but you've refused to give that uh, uh, calf some salt. The old farmer looked at him and said, no, I, I wouldn't refuse giving him some salt, but I sure goodness wouldn't put the whole sack down one little calf. So that's what happened that day. Just one man got the whole sermon. And so we're going to speak about salt in verse 13. Year the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, where well, shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Now that's a very important verse of scripture. The Bible has many things to say about salt. We can get a message from it that would be good for us today. Now salt was even more indispensable to the Hebrews than to us as he used it as an Antidote to the effect of the heat of the climate on animal food. Salt symbolizes hospitality, durability, and purity. To eat the salt of a king was to owe him the uttermost fidelity. To eat bread and salt together was to make an unbreakable league of fellowship. We believe we have eaten the bread, the broken body of Jesus, our Savior, and he's challenged us to be the salt of the earth. We must do so or be cast out and be trodden underfoot of men. You know, Jesus looking at these disciples said, Ye are the salt of the earth. Now we have much water on this planet earth. 
And out in the Atlantic Ocean, we find that water from the Atlantic Ocean yields 81 pounds of salt to a ton, a ton of water, of course. The Pacific Ocean yields 79 pounds of salt to a ton. The Arctic and Antarctic yields 85 pounds of salt to a ton. But the Dead Sea yields 180 pounds of salt to a ton. If you've never been to the Dead Sea, I've been there many times. That's the saltest water you've ever placed on your tongue. You stick your finger in the Dead Sea and Lay your thing on your tongue, it feels like it's going to stick together. Feels like you want to pull the hat off your tongue when you take your finger off. It's the saltest water in the world today to the size of the pond. And it's very salty because it has no outlet. And all the salt that goes into the Dead Sea remains there because it cannot get out. As the, as the sun draws out the water that it might fall again, the salt remains there. Now, there's several things I want to say about salt today. And Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. Where is the salt? We need to find out more about it today. Number one, salt counteracts sin. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13, And every obligation of thy meat offering shall thou season with salt. Neither shall thou suffer the salt of the covenant thy God to be likened from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Now the reason for that is salt counteracts sin, or leaven, in the Bible. And the, of course, salt counteracting sin is typical of a Christian doing likewise. For instance, let me illustrate the point. You've heard me tell this before. A little boy that should have been in Sunday school one Sunday decided to go fishing. And he tried to hide the fish. But the preacher saw him anyway. And then the little boy pulled the fish out behind his back and said, uh, Preacher, I want you to see what these fish got into by biting bait on Sunday. Several years ago, I had a good deacon, and he was condemned about smoking his cigarettes. Poor fellow, he tried to give them up, and, and he had a battle trying to give up his cigarettes. He knew they were killing him, and he wanted to give them up. They were damaging to his health. But he seemed like he just couldn't get the victory. He did not want me to see him smoking. He always tried to hide it from the preacher because the pastor counteracted that situation. One day I came up on him. He was working on his automobile and he didn't know I was around and he had a cigarette. And he didn't think I saw the cigarette so he grabbed it right quick and stuck it in his pocket and held his hand in his pocket hoping maybe I'd leave in a second or two and I kept standing there talking, smoke began to boil out of his pocket. Now, he was in bad shape. He didn't want to burn his pocket and didn't want the preacher to see him uh, smoking. So I felt sorry for the poor fellow, and I just turned and told him I'd see him later. I didn't want to burn his head and burn his pocket and burn his clothes. Now, why did he do that? Well, the reason is he had been condemned about it. He knew he should give him up. He didn't want his pastor to know that he smoked and uh, he just, uh, my very present counteracted that situation. Now, that's what I'm talking about when I say that uh, salt counteracts sin. And the salt in the life of a Christian should make sinners miserable in your presence because you know God and live in for God, and they should be miserable in your presence. Now, as, if you don't have much salt about you, then they might not have much respect for you. And then if you continue on like that, you won't be worth anything for God but to be cast out and trotting on the foot of men. So salt counteracts sin. Number two, we find that salt sustains life. As a young man many years ago, I met my call for my country to go out and fight for this nation and fight for my family, my wife and my children and others. And they called me in the hottest months in the year. And sent me to Camp Blanding, Florida, the hardest place on this side of the earth as far as I'm concerned, or this side of hell, rather. I thought that anyway, during those days. And we took our basic training there in dead hot summer months. I went out in July. And they made us take a salt, eat that salt, to keep our salt in our bloodstream. We'd go out there and uh, we'd uh, march and drill and run and jump and so forth and and we had to take a lot of salt because we was losing a lot of salt as we perspired out there taking the training. And I hated that stuff. I didn't like to take salt tablets, but they required that of us. 
They said if you don't do it, then you may just pass out. And that was true because of loss of salt in the bloodstream. Now salt sustains life. Now salt in your, uh, your bloodstream keeps you alive. Now this is why we have so many dead churches today. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Many churches today have lost their salt and they've gone into an entertainment program. They build their big social halls and places of amusement and places to entertain and they try to hold their people in through entertainment and hot dog suppers and things of that type because they've lost their salt. Now, if a church has plenty of salt, you don't need all kind of worldly entertainment and gimmicks to keep people in the house of God. If you entice people in by entertainment, then you're going to have to maintain that entertaining to keep them there. If you win somebody in your church by giving them a hot dog, somebody else will come along and win them away by giving them two hot dogs. And so if you don't hold people by the preaching of the gospel... And old-fashioned worshiping God and praying and soul winning and giving of your tithes and offerings and fellowship and loving God. If you don't hold people that way, it's not worthwhile to try to hold them any other way. But churches today that's lost their salt are real busy in the matter of gimmicks, in the matter of entertainment, in the matter of glutton, in the matter of trying to get people to come in and hold them by entertainment. And that never works. You might hold them for a while, but that plays out. That's nothing in the world that'll take the place of old-fashioned praying and witnessing and preaching and testifying and studying God's Word. Nothing will take the place of that. Now, you read about the early church in the book of Acts and see how many entertainment programs they had on in that day. None. They didn't believe in that junk because they knew it wasn't right. They believed in going from house to house witnessing for Jesus, having prayer meetings and fellowship and getting people to God, preaching the gospel. That was the way in those days. So we know salt sustains life. And a church today that's real salty in that respect don't have to worry about uh, sugarcoating a little message to keep people in the house of God. Number three, salt saves by contact. Back when I was a young boy growing up, my father and my grandfathers, I've seen them many times in the winter time, in the late fall, they'd have what they call hog killing time. They would raise some hogs and then they would go out and kill those hogs and they'd place them down in a huge box and they would salt them down. They'd put salt on that meat. Now the reason they did that salt saves by contact and those farmers knew that. If they had placed that fresh meat in that box without putting salt in there, it would soon spoil. Because the salt in there draws out that which causes meat to spoil. They knew that. And therefore, they put salt in there. That meat would keep for a long period of time. And through contact, they saved their meat in that respect. Now, they could set a bucket of salt on the outside of the box. They could put a bucket on top of the box. But that would not have preserved that meat. That salt had to contact that meat. And as the salt contacted the meat, it saved the meat. It kept it from spoiling. Now many people today are saved by contact. Jesus in John chapter 4 met a woman at the well. And he talked with her and reached her through personal contact. One of the greatest ways in the world to win people to God is through a personal contact. You can reach people many times in that respect when you can't reach them any other way. Now a man that sells insurance, a man that sells automobiles, a businessman that knows how to run business knows the real value of contact. I remember several years ago, there's a couple of fellows in my church, I won't call their names, they're not here anymore. Uh, but anyway, they started working for L.B. Price's Mercantile Company. They had never sold anything of that type and they'd pull up in a yard and blow the horn and some lady had come to the door, maybe had dough on her hands or broom while she's busy cleaning the house and one of them would stick his head out the window and say, you don't want to buy any L.B. Price mercantile stuff today, do you? She said, well, certainly not. Slam the door, go on about a business. And that's no way to sell anything. They didn't sell anything. They soon went out of business as far as they're concerned. Got to be like the filling station man. He, you pull up to his tank and said, you want me to fill it up, don't you? 
Well, if you didn't, you might say, yeah, go ahead. And he fills it up. You wouldn't, he wouldn't come out there and say, you don't buy a gallon or two, do you? No, there's always a way of doing things. And you can win people through that personal contact. Look a man in the eyes, take him by the hand, tell him about God. Tell him how you got saved. Tell him if he don't get saved, he's going to hell. And you can win him many times when you can't win him any other way. I was won to God through personal contact. My precious mother, who's in heaven today, along with a preacher over in Inman, South Carolina, who's disabled to preach today. He's, he's an old, old man at this time. And he and my mother won me to God in my home. And I could mention today some of the greatest preachers that ever graced the American continent were won to God by personal contact. For instance, J. Harold Smith was a, is a great soul winner. His sister won him to God on her front porch. Dwight L. Moody was won to God in a shoe store. And he robbed hell of over a million souls. Some of the greatest Christian workers and ministers that's ever been saved have been won to God through the personal contact. That contact, that contact does something. And so we find that salt saves by contact. Number four, salt crystals symbolize a four square life. That salt crystal is four square. Now God's people may be called square sometimes. They should be four square speaking uh, in a gospel way. Old Daddy Brock, a great preacher up in North Carolina, he's in heaven today, used to preach on the city life four square. He always used the illustration about a sawmill. He said he's gone to a sawmill and they'd bring in these huge logs and had knots on them where they'd cut the limbs off and they'd put that big old log on that carriage and then they'd run the carriage by the saw and, and they'd come off with one side of that log. They'd turn it over and come off with another side. Knots and, and all of that on the log would disappear. They'd turn it one more time and come off with another side. They'd turn it the fourth time and come off with the final side. And he said they would have a log there, four square, as beautiful as you've ever seen. Could be used for a seal under a house. It could be used to cut lumber from, but it was made four square by that sawmill, by the saw and the carriage. And he said Christian people ought to be like that. As we preach the gospel, the gospel should knock off the knots in the bad places and square you up for you to do service for God. A salt crystal is a square thing, and should every Christian be like that? Yes. Where is the salt today? In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 16, the city lies four square. Where is the salt? Jesus said, yield the salt to the earth. Number five, salt creates a thirst. Now, I've seen people when I was a farm boy growing up, I've seen my parents and grandparents uh, give salt to their uh, livestock. And it would create a thirst and to drink a lot of water. Now, you know that to be true. You can eat a lot of salt or eat salt and meat or whatever. It'll make you thirsty. It creates a thirst. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Every Christian should be so salty, saturated with salt, until he created a longing in somebody's heart to be more like Jesus. Many years ago, I read about a great preacher out yonder in, in Texas. Dr. Hyman Alphabet, he sat on the platform of Dr. George W. Truett. Dr. George W. Truett was a preacher of the First Baptist Church there for many years, a very Christ-like man. And Dr. Hyman Alphabet said this, he said, to sit on the platform with that man made me feel like I was sitting right in the very presence of Jesus Christ. That man was so much like God. Now our lives should be and our testimony should be with such strength and power and with such salt until we would create a thirst in the lives of others to be more like Jesus. There was a man in the city of Greenville many years ago, a layman, man that walked with God, and, and he was so close to God, such a wonderful person, until when he would conduct prayer meeting as a lay speaker, they would fill the house just to hear him talk and give his testimony. He died a young man, but everybody wanted to be like him because he was such a fine Christian gentleman. He was salty enough to create a thirst in the hearts of others to be more like Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 13, you're the salt of the earth. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 3, for I will pour water upon him that's thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed, my blessings upon thine offspring. 
Jesus said, if you're thirsty, if you have no soul to buy you to be thirsty, you'll be filled. In John 7 and verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now you should have a desire to be more like the Lord. Now God's servants and God's people should create that thirst in you to be more like the Lord Jesus. Then we find that salt cleanses and heals. I understand the salt in the rocks and the ground purifies the water. It's antiseptic for that water. As that water comes out of the mountains, as it flows toward the ocean, those rocks and the salt in the earth uh, that cleanses that water and purifies that water. And of course the water is purified as it moves along over the rocks that contain the salt, over the hard ground that contains the salt. Beloved, salt is wonderful in its place and we need to always remember that. Salt cleanses and heal. Now you have a place on your body maybe that, that uh, uh, maybe you, uh, somebody says have a, uh, a sore throat. As you use this illustration. Suppose you have a sore throat. They say if you goggle that with warm salt water, it'll help it. And I believe it will. It's helped me. Salt is good to brush your teeth with occasionally. A little salt and soda is good for your gum. Salt has a healing process. And so a Christian should be a person that helps to heal a situation. The better a community uh, to get things accomplished for God and then in order to get sin. That's the way a Christian should be. And then we find number seven that salt preserves. Now that salt on the farmer's meat preserved his meat, kept it from spoiling. Now we find that God told Abraham, he said, Abraham, if I find ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll spare Sodom and Gomorrah. But he couldn't find ten righteous people there and God destroyed that place. Had there been ten there, then they would have preserved Sodom and Gomorrah, but there were not ten righteous people there. Abraham thought, surely Lot's got his family to God, but he hadn't. And so Lot had lost his savor. He was no good in Sodom and Gomorrah. When they went out and tried to win his in-laws to God, they laughed at him. Now we need to realize it's the salt today that's holding back the wrath of God from this earth. Now, when the salt is gone, when the church is gone, God's wrath is coming. You better believe that. Where is the salt? Beloved, one of these days you'll leave the earth and God's wrath will come. Number eight, salt can be painful when applied to cuts and bruises. You know that. I moved to the community one time. There's a fellow lived next door to me. And when a preacher moved in, he moved out. He liked to have his partners. He said, I'm not going to live close to a preacher. And he had sold out and was gone in less than 30 days after I moved in. Why? I was an antidote to what he was doing. He didn't want to live close to a preacher. Now, if a man's not doing right, not living right, the last person he wants to see is a preacher or a good Christian that's living for God. Salt will burn in places on your body. Now, some time ago, a girl from Virginia came to a letter, and um, two or three men there saw her talking to her a fellow of a different race, and they go take this girl and carry her to a place, maybe a motel, and there they beat her, they raped her, they sexually abused her, they burn her with uh, cigarette lighters, they burn her with cigarettes, they took a razor blade and cut her flesh and poured salt in it, poured salt in it. They actually broke bones in her body while she was yet alive. Now that was awful, wasn't it? Now, what if that had been your daughter or your sister, your relative treated like that when this ungodly boy who was the rank leader of the group did that, wicked man, and they sentenced him to die in the electric chair. That's exactly what they should have done. There was a judge and a jury sentenced that man to die. Last week, the wicked appeal courts and judges, the liberals, the infidels, stayed that sentence. They said, no, we're not going to let him die. We're going to put off that. This past week, there were two death sentences put off in the state of Georgia. They're making a joke out of the judge and the jury. There's not much need to have a jury anymore for a person that commits murder because if he's sentenced to death, these liberals, these infidels, these crime lovers and God haters, they're going to stay at execution. Then you've got a bunch of idiots that's going to put on an all-night vigil and sing and they might as well be praying to the devil as far as getting their prayers answered. And, and there they're going to put on a vigil to keep people out of the electric chair. 
and they're a bunch of infidels and ignoramuses as far as I'm concerned fighting against God in the Bible and they have no concern about the victim or the loved ones of that victim that's put to death. Amen. That boy that treated that girl in that manner they should have broke his neck within a week's time. But instead of doing that, they let you, the taxpayer, go ahead and pay up $20,000 a year to feed the low-down, dirty dog and keep him alive. And these judges and appeal courts and these liberals, ACLU crowd, the crime-loving group and all that crowd is going to face God in the judgment for not doing what God said in this book. Now, this Bible teaches chapter of punishment. And any man that tries to keep a person being electrocuted or put to death when he's committed cold-blooded murder is working against God. He's working against the Bible. He's working against the law-abiding citizens in this country. And he'll answer God for it in the day of judgment. And they don't know any more about God than the cow knows when Sunday comes, although many of them call themselves reverend. They know nothing about God. Beloved, if we don't get rid of some of these liberal appeal court judges, one of these days, you're going to find more innocent people dying than you ever dreamed. Now, some of our politicians, I can't understand why some of our politicians sit back and allow things like that to go on and keep their mouths shut. I contend when election time comes, need to get rid of some of these old jaybirds that won't do anything about crime and put somebody in office maybe that will try to do something about it. Now, it's, it's making a joke out of our juries and out of our innocent judges and lawyers that convict that man and sentence him to death by a jury and then these wicked ungodly liberals they stay that execution these God haters and infidels and crime lovers they stay that execution and they claim to do it on the authority of God's word and they know nothing about God's word that's ignorant as a cow when it comes to things of God and you're welcome if you don't like it you can let me leave it leap it or whatever you want to do it's the truth anyway now, salt is bad in bruises, no doubt about that. But we find that salt will do you good sometimes. It has a healing application. Where's the salt? We need it today to get the job done. Salt should add a good flavor. I don't like to eat flat food. I like salt on my food. And I, I assume you do. Sometimes people, because of high blood uh, uh, trouble, they can't eat too much salt. But I like salt. And I like it on my food. It's too flat without it. Now salt adds a good flavor and so should Christian people in the church in the community. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, Jesus, or rather Paul said, Let your speech be always grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Our conversation should be seasoned with salt, that whenever we speak to someone or someone asks our advice or help, we'll know how to do it. And we can help them with a healing application. We need to do that. We should serve the Lord with gladness. Then number 10, salt is a saver. Or if it's not a savior, it'll be trotting on the foot of men. Salt is good. But if we don't use the salt, if we're not the kind of salt we should be, and Jesus said you're the salt of the earth, you'll soon come to the place where you're no good. Just to be cast out and trotting on the foot of men. You're not good for uh, preservation. You're not good for healing. You're not good for flavor. You're not good for anything. Salt, it has no savor. It's no good. You can't find any place where it'll do any good. You can't put it in your garden. You can't place it anywhere where it'll do any good. And Jesus said, if you have lost your savor as salt, then you're no good. Just to be cast out in the walkway and let people walk over you. And you have a lot of church members like that today. They have lost their salt. They have lost their effectiveness. They're no more good for God. There used to be a day when they were, had great influence for God and did wonders for God. They have lost that, and they've lost all of that influence. They're no good. And salt, when it's lost its flavor, it's no good. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 50, salt is good, but if salt have lost its salt, it's why we shall it see you season it. Jesus said, then have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Beloved, we need to be salty Christians. Where is the salt? God wants us to be filled with salt, so to speak, as Christian people. Where is the salt today in our churches? In most of our churches today, it's gone. It's gone. That's why the preacher has to get up and sugarcoat his messages and, in order to get them to come to the house of God. 
We need to preach the word of God in its fullness. And through the preaching of the word of God, you have the salt. Where is the salt? Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. God bless you. Listen well today. Stand at your feet, will you please? Our Father, I pray that you'll take the message, that you use it to thy glory. May thy name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. Our Father, help us to be salty, salty to the glory of God. That we might preserve, might create a thirst, that we might cleanse, that we might heal, that we might help our Father as we sojourn as a church, as we sojourn as an individual. God, use the message today and speak to hearts not only in this auditorium, but out in the vast radio listening audience. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Debbie's going to play for us as she plays on the instrument. Now, you listen to me. If you're in this building and you are not saved, if you should die in that condition, you'll go to hell and be tormented forever. You may say, Preach, I don't believe in hell. That doesn't change the fact of it. Someone came to me and said, Preach, I don't believe in such places as Athens, Georgia. You think that'd bother me? I just know he's ignorant. I know there's Athens, Georgia. I know there's a hell. I know there's a heaven. Now, I know this Bible tells us if you die without God, you're going to hell and be tormented forever. No second chance after death. No such thing as purgatory. That's a lie of the devil. Beloved, there's a hell waiting for every sinner that dies without God. There's a heaven waiting for every Christian that dies in the faith. And today, if God is speaking to your heart, if you want to become more salty, more yielded to God, to the glory of God, if you want to get saved, if you want to join this church, if any reason that God has moved upon your heart to respond to this invitation, you ought to do it. And do it this morning while we wait. Would you come? Somebody needs to get saved today. Would you come? Someone needs to come back to God. Someone losing your salt. Where's the salt? Are you losing your salt today? You can be just as salty for God as God would have you to be if you want to be. Just as salty as you want to be to the glory of God. While she plays and while we wait, would you like to get saved? The point of men wants to die and after that the judgment. I've preached to people that walked out the door and never heard another gospel message. I've done it time and time again. They died without another gospel message. Just a few hours ago, yesterday morning I believe, but there's your pardon's grandson, Russell Parton, 22 years old, on a motorcycle coming home down here around Washington, Georgia. A truck cut across in front of him, killed him instantly. The body's way up Bernstein's right now. 22 year old boy used to sit here and swing his feet as we preach the gospel. A little boy, just a kid. Cut off suddenly, 22 years old, girl with him, leg cut off and Critical condition, understand. You never know. I'll preach against these motorcycles. If you want to go out here and ride one and get killed, that's you fought. But I, they're too unsafe, too dangerous. I preach against them, I'm against them. If you want to get killed on a motorcycle, that's your business. I preached to people, went out, got on their motorcycle and died. A motorcycle race. And dangerous, I wouldn't have one of them to give it to me. I wouldn't sell it to anybody afraid of encouragement to commit suicide. Dangerous. While we wait, we're going to close in just a moment. <laughs>